I hope anyone people can see me. I just want to make sure that you can. Right, hello and welcome to Campaign's inaugural In Housing Summit. I'm Gideon Spanier, I'm the UK Editor-in-Chief of Campaign, and we're really pleased to be hosting this virtual event with our exclusive partner, Oliver. Now, the reason that we're holding this event is because, as I wrote in a column in Campaign in April, In Housing is here to stay and growing. Uh, the phenomenon of advertisers wanting to manage more of their marketing themselves is not new, but I think the pandemic did accelerate things. We saw during the pandemic Hello that and welcome digital to campaigns to inaugural become in more central summit. the way that companies do business in the pandemic. It makes sense for really brands to invest in their own capabilities, whether their agencies like it or not. So when I talk to advertisers, I know that they're motivated by a mixture of reasons. It might be saving money, moving faster, creating higher volumes of content. And I think really crucially, bringing marketing closer to the heart of their business and to their first party data. Uh, plus of course, self-serve tools make it easier to buy direct from media platforms. Uh, one more thing, there are lots of inflate flavors of in-housing. I think people sometimes think of it as being quite binary, either the brand does everything uh, or the brand uh, lets the agency do everything. In fact, it could involve an internal client team, uh, a mix of uh, an on-site agency with external staff in the client's office, uh, a hybrid. There are lots of different flavors, and we're going to hear about that from uh, this fantastic array of speakers we've got lined up throughout the day to talk to you about their experiences and just some of the brands who are talking Unilever, Eon, Shell, Lego, Lloyds Banking Group, M&S Food. And I think whether you're at a brand, an agency, a media owner or in another part of the advertising and marketing ecosystem, you're going to learn a tremendous amount today. So it's going to be an exciting day. Um, with so, so many great speakers, there's a chance to ask them questions through our interactive Q&A tab and comment. And that's you, you can use that via the chat function on the right of your screens. There's also opportunities for you to network, discuss some of the issues that you have observed and heard about using the app's network networking function. And of course, please visit Oliver's virtual booth where you'll find a wealth of information about their work in the market. So I wanna thank all the speakers for joining us and for you for attending with this. We've got a very good turnout. Thanks again to Oliver for their support. And you'll be able to hear from them during a number of sessions during the course of the day. So we're on to the first session and it's asking whether creative skills are compromised when taking marketing functions in house. And I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Gemma Charles, deputy editor, Gemma has had a few video problems, but she's here and has got a great panel. So Gemma, over to you. Good morning. Hi, sorry, I'm just a voice. <laughs> uh, a few gremlins have been uh, playing up on my system, but hopefully that won't affect anybody's enjoyment of this because um, the videos on all of the great, on all of the great panelists are working. So anyway, I'm Gemma Child, the deputy editor of Campaign. So on this panel, we're going to be discussing whether creative skills are compromised when brands take marketing in-house. So to discuss this, we've got Scott Somerville, Head of Brand and Marketing at E.ON UK. Hello, Scott. Morning. Hi, hi. And we have Jane Sayers, the Global Discipline Lead, Film and Content Engine at Shell. Hi, Jane. Hi, Jane. And then we've got Simon Martin, who's the founder and chief executive of Oliver. Good morning. Hi, Simon. Good morning. And then we've got Giles Morrison. Now take a deep breath for this. It's, he's global vice president, brand communications and global brand vice president, Unilever brand at Unilever. Did I get that right, Giles? Um, hang on, am I on mute? Yes, you did. Absolutely. Oh. Perfect. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Jane, I think. Um, so, you know, let's look at the title of this session, 
which is, you know, our, our creative skills compromise when brands take marketing in-house. Jane, I mean, what, what, do you, what do you say to this as someone who's, you know, very much in, in there doing this at Shell? Um, you know, does, ha, is having people who, do you miss having people who can bring experience from working on accounts from different businesses, like you can at an agency, or are you able to still create some kind of magic in, in-house? What would you say to that? I think we still create magic in-house, actually, Gemma. Um, the content engine team is three years old at the moment. It's, it, it runs with a core team of individuals who remain, um, and we supplement with freelance talent when we need to. And invariably, that's for our large or larger projects, big global recruitment campaigns, things of that nature. So we're picking from the same talent pool as outside agencies when it comes to getting those freelancers in. So there's not there's there's no difference there. And of course, you just have to be incredibly careful when you're recruiting a core team that you're getting the perfect combination of talent with that team. And I think we've done that really well. But but for me, there's there's three things that that I think are more advantageous about being in house than out of house. Um, firstly, you build up absolutely expert knowledge of that brand. Um, not not just the visual identity or the audible identity, but you know the brand, its personality, how it wants to communicate with people. So the team are incredibly knowledgeable about that, um, which is a massive help. They're not having to learn the brand every time on a new on a new job. Um, the shell email address. It sounds so simple, but but just the trust that colleagues around Shell have in knowing that they're dealing with somebody in-house is a definite advantage. And then there's one thing that we haven't anticipated actually, but we're definitely finding. And that is that because we're in-house, we have a greater ability to push back at clients in order to up creativity than we see outside agencies being able to do. And I think that's because, you know, we're not having to protect the account. We are the incumbent. We're going to remain the incumbent. Um, and that and that ability to to just take things to a next level is setting our content apart. OK, that's a great starter, Jane. Thanks for that. Um, Scott, I'm going to come to you um, now. I know that you've if you could t- explain a bit about how much of your work you've in housed. I know that you I think you. Um, appointed engine um, um, maybe at the beginning of this year so you're obviously still you know working with major agencies and what what's what's your situation what have you found yeah well well at eon we've we've got a real mix so the relationship with engine goes back i think probably four or five years now um, and went through a, a, a sort of procurement driven refresh uh, at the start of this year um in that respect but we also uh look you know, have a mixture in different areas of the business. And I think as Gideon set out in the introduction and as, as Jane has said, I think we all as marketeers focus in on in-housing versus agency as if it's some kind of binary choice, as if one works or, or, or one doesn't. I think for us, we've tried got a real mixture of great agency relationships, but we've got in-house areas as well. And that's, to, you know, direct employees where we do work, which my background, you know, integrated marketer now, of course, but fundamentally, you know, cut my teeth in PR and all the rest of it, where I think, you know, maybe slightly different to the more advertising and brand side of things where because of the nature of writing, because of the nature of media relations, it's always been more in-house, as it were, you'd have agency support, but you were creating in that way as well, whereas I think there used to be that bit more of a divide between perhaps a brand manager and then more of the creative side from the agency. And that blending of things, I think, is we're seeing across owned, earned and paid now. So, so Eon, we have that mix. We have top level support from the likes of likes of Engine. We also, um, as say, have... have um, or on the production side, agency staff embedded with us. And that's the blend that works for us. I think it's finding what works for you, what brings out the best of your team. I think, you know, again, excited and, and very envious as, of, as Jane sets out of, of, she thinks they've got creatively stronger from having the work in-house. We find it's that external challenge that really helps us. You know, as an organisation, we can sometimes be a little bit for good reason, but risk averse or conservative with a small C. So actually having that external voice helps us to focus, helps to push us. But it's really, you know, it is horses for courses. So 
we've got a mixture and that's what we find works for us. And I think that the, the bit as well where we do still rely on that external support, but I'm sure Simon will go on to talk about this, that mixture of in-house and uh, agency support, being able to scale the resource, that's the other bit that's probably the big barrier that stopped us from going full in-house at the moment, as well as getting that external perspective. So a bit of around the houses, Gemma, but hopefully, as I say, we've got a blend. And you can hear we're wrestling with this topic, right? And it's about how do you find the right people? How do you find that right mix? So, um, yeah, hopefully that's a, a helpful start. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it is. Absolutely. And we are going to come to, to Simon now, actually. Um, you mentioned him, Scott. So, I mean, Simon, obviously the, the title of this session is sort of provocative <laughs> uh, to, to try and get some uh, good discussion yeah. going. So I'm sure you would obviously take issue with um, the, the idea that creative skills are compromised when in-housing occurs. Um, but what do you believe is the, the effect on creativity when a brand makes that move away from the sort of traditional agency client model? Um, well, I think creativity is an outcome of a, of a tension. You know, the tension is, you know, trying to find the best answer, the best work, accumulating all of the inputs that you need, insights, data, whatever it might be, understanding of the brand. Uh, and I think um, both Jane and Scott have said it have said it perfectly. You know, it's about talent, bringing talent, allowing them to um, express themselves, providing them with the, the environment to, you know, to achieve that tension. I thought that was a really interesting point that Jane made. That actually, in some ways, um, you know, they don't have the, the the people creating the work in in Shell's world are not encumbered by you know, the, the fact that they've got to please a client, you know, they can actually say, no, this is not good enough. And I think that's a really interesting dynamic. Um, but I also think there's a, an advantage to, you know, there's no one group of people, whether it be an agency or a group of, um, you know, creatives, have got a monopoly on all the best ideas. You know, we need to um, provide the, the fertile ground for, for ideas to flourish and grow with the right inputs and I don't, I, I think it's a very old notion that only agencies can come up with the best creative ideas. Um, I think it's about, you know, the environment and the tools that they have and, the, and, and basically the culture of way creative comes into being. Um, so I think there are many ways to do it. I wouldn't say in-house is necessarily better or worse. I wouldn't say external is necessarily better or worse. It's the environment in which you create to allow that creativity to happen. Okay. And um, Giles, let's let's come to you. Um, obviously, you've got a sort of wealth of experience, having um, kind of overseen U, U Studio for since twenty sixteen. Um, I mean, where would you? You've got someone like Scott who's kind of starting on this journey. Um, given that wealth of experience, what kind of tips would you give to marketers at the start of that journey who are thinking about this? Uh, yeah, uh, so you know the the first thing I'd say is is that the um, the in housing trend is uh, probably only just getting going. So you know I think the, the the reasons why we did what we did in back in 2016 with U Studio when we first started the pilots uh, and the principles that we applied then, I would say they still apply now. So they're still very relevant today. And I'd probably say. I'd say, you know, there's probably three, three things to think about on this, you know, for um, brands who are looking to start the journey. I'd um, really can think about fluidity. Um, so, you know, our, our youth studio setup is, is really, in essence, it's a very different way of working. That's the core of it. It's a very different way of working than how we were working before. So there are no barriers, really, either physical or emotional barriers between uh, the marketers and the, you know, the agency folk. Um, and and that's really well suited for the kind of of uh, you know complex uh, of the kind of processes, the creative work, the kind of assets that you're making to sort of feed the really fast moving digital ecosystem that you've got today. So I think that's a really important thing to think about. Um, I would say the second one is partnership. Um, so our youth studios are, are actually a hybrid model. Um, Gideon actually mentioned that word in his uh, opening speech. And that is precisely what ours is. So we have some people and resources who are Unilever. We have some people and resources who are from Oliver. Um, and I think that gives both parties, uh, you know, skin in the game. Um, so, you know, I, I would argue you get the best of both worlds. You get 
the sort of internal gravitas, a bit of what Jane was referring to, I think, and you also get an external perspective. So I, I'm, I'm quite a fan of the partnership model on this. And then the last point I'd make is around flexibility, really. So, you know, a, a key benefit of, of this sort of in-housing yet outsourcing approach, which is what we, we've done with Oliver, actually, um, is that you can build this internal expertise at the same time as being able to be very flexible, you know, um, regarding the skills and experiences that we have on the Oliver side, you know. So if we need to change things, and, and of course, as we all know, the, you know, the, the, in the world we live in, we need to change things often, quite, you know, quite often. So when we need to change things, it's actually a bit easier to do that through the kind of relationship that we have with Oliver. So I think that, again, as well, is quite well suited to this fast-paced digital world we're living in. Okay. And, I mean, just bring it to life a bit. So what... Give me an example of a, a great campaign that has come out of this um, arrangement. Um, well, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one to answer. Um, first of all, because we, uh, you know, and, and I'm just going to, a big plug to my team and to the Oliver guys, we, we, in 2020, we got 48 nominations and 21 external awards. Um, and I think we were also the, the, the most awarded UK in-house agency of the, you know, uh, of the year. Uh, and of course, we also were global agency of the year uh, for in-housing. So, you know, we've got lots to choose from, but if I go back to the, to the last five years, one of my personal favorites was the, the work we did around the, the, the Brexit campaign that we did for Marmite. So uh, if, you, if anyone remembers that, we did some brilliant work and that came from U Studio. Uh, and, and of course, what it did was take the, the very divisive uh, discussions that were going on around, Bre around Brexit and then bring it down to what Marmite knows about, which is actually about breakfast. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, personally, I love it. Of course, you, you might hate it, but then that's Marmite for you, I guess. Indeed, indeed. Um, so we've had a few questions already. So um, I'm going to go to them and try and get through them as much as possible. Um, right. I'll go to the first one, which was... Um, Jane, this is to you actually. It's it's somebody's asked um, what kind of work is Shell doing in house, and perhaps when you answer that, Jane, maybe you could give an example of um, one of your um, the favourite campaigns that perhaps you, that you've created. Sure. So we we have very much a hybrid model. Um, the content engine team does about forty percent of the film work that's coming out of Shell, and that's just film work but we sit within a larger creative department at Shell that at the moment predominantly uses external agencies for design, photography, and other creative disciplines. Um, we, we would, the content engine team would ordinarily take care of the kind of prestigious film assets. So um, it was Shell Strategy Day in February this year, and the content engine team made all the content for that that um, went out across social media. Um, they were in control of a very large global recruitment campaign a couple of years ago. We were just about to go into phase two of that when lockdown happened and everything changed. Um, so that will come around again next year now, I think. Um, that was called the future yours to make um, vast numbers of assets, you know, a big global campaign. And that was an example where we brought in some freelance talent to supplement the core team in order to in order to grow it. We do internal content occasionally with the content engine team, but predominantly their work is external facing and, and, and broadcast across social media platforms globally. Okay, thanks for that, Jane. Um, right, we've got another question here. Have the panelists proved that the creative output in-house is equal in effectiveness? I mean, it doesn't say equal to what, but I presume that's um, we're all Lauren external uh, agency, I suppose. Uh, who would like to take that? Um, Scott, have you done any work in that area? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. So I think I'm sure we're, we're fairly typical. I think of, of any campaign with, with any 
pot of investment behind it. We're looking at, you know, standard things across effectiveness and messaging and how consumers have responded. And I think regardless of where it's been produced and what channel, you know, that's what, you know, ultimately it's, I suppose, a likability, right? You know, so those same measurements for our in-house work is used to justify um, the same external investment we'd make with, what, with, with the likes of Engine or, or one of our other partners. And I think that's the key to all of this as well, is making sure that, you know, just because something's in-house, it, you know, it doesn't mean that it's not got a cost attached, does it? It doesn't mean that it's not part of your budget. And again, that's, you know, for those of us working in, in large organisations, there's always that part of ultimately being a central service as well. So, you know, there's the creative side, of course, of in-housing, but it's again justifying, you know, as a pound internally spent, at least the same as a pound externally, and then looking at the service you provide there. So mixture of effectiveness, got to make sure we, 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 we track the financial side of it as well. And I think when I look across either work we've done or indeed um, work by other organisations, it's the same test, isn't it? You know, a, a good creative is, is a campaign that works well and it doesn't matter where it's done. I think where I've seen in the past and experienced myself and made mistakes around in-housing in the past and indeed with agencies, you know, and when, when pitches go wrong ultimately and all the rest of it, it's about making sure you are starting, you're putting creative at the heart, you know, of the work you're doing. I think where I've seen it go wrong is where you start to get led, I guess, you know, by the investment case or the costs. So you're looking at doing something to save money. And I think that's been interesting for me over the last 18 months, especially during the pandemic, with so many organizations looking to trim back, looking to, to take a pause, is, you know, should we in-house because it saves money? You know, and I, you know, truthfully, I hear that around our place as well, right? What's the balance? But again, the question just points to the heart of the matter, doesn't it? You've got to make sure your campaigns resonate and you've got to make sure that works. So for me, I think, you know, it's, it's always testing, always checking. One or the other isn't better. A good campaign is a good campaign, but you've got to, as we keep saying, I think on, on all of us speaking, it's the right people, it's the right perspectives, and that's what leads to good work. And you should never compromise in that creativity because ultimately that cash you'll save, that, you know, slightly faster way of working, whatever. If the campaign's a dud at the end of the day, those two things are going in the bin. So that's got to always be at the heart of this. So the creative possibilities of in-housing or agency work have always got to be right at the top of the order, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, um, we've got so many questions, so I'm gonna try and get through as, as many as we can. Um, all right, here's, um, here's one directly to Simon. It says, um, Simon, what would you say is number one is the number one success factor in the in-house setup? Uh, I would say, you know, uh, getting the culture right, creating a genuine um, partnership uh, with the people that are engaging with with the in-house agency. I think that um, really understanding the the, the as, as uh, Jane was saying earlier, the culture of the business and ensuring that you know the teams that we're deploying have all of the right tools and the right environment which to work but also there is a sharing of, of culture you want them to have a their own creative um you know freedom and ability to you know really stretch the boundaries and do brilliant work but similarly you want them to be feeling really part of the culture and and really in one with partnership with the uh, with the internal clients that are that are you know consuming their service um, so for me, it is about culture. I think the most sustainable advantage of any business actually is the culture that you have. But I think building an in-house agency with the right culture and the right alignment of goals and ambitions with the, um, with the, the client organization effectively is, is absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now we've had two questions about the briefing process. So um, I def def we definitely should touch on this topic. And actually it's something that we wrote about this week. Um, uh, some research which found that there's a big disconnect between um, marketers and agencies in terms of how um, successfully a marketers think they're briefing versus agencies thinking that they're not marketers aren't very good at briefing them. <laughs> so um, there's this big sort of uh, kind of uh, perception gap there. So I, I don't know if these questions might maybe they've seen this this research. I don't know, but. The two questions, which I guess we can sort of take together, uh, one of them is how are you briefing your in-house studios? And then the other one is a, pan a panel member organization still briefing in the same way. So um, Giles, does that sound like one you can um, comment on? 
Yeah, of course. So we, uh, you know, the honest answer is that we brief in lots of different ways um, when it comes to U-Studio. So when you think about it, well, it, it's a spectrum really. So when you look at, um, if you need to do something very, very quick, like super quick, you, you know, given that also we have these U-Studios sat amongst our marketers, you can literally have a situation where someone comes up to someone's desk and briefs them over their shoulder. Yeah, about something they need that is super quick. Let's say you need to be just making a very little little tweak to a particular asset. You know, that that's the kind of fluidity that I was talking about before, so you can move things on quickly. That's still a briefing of one kind. And then of course you have stuff that is maybe a little bit more, you know, that is um, that requires more resources and more and more planning, but is, um, you know, still one of those ones where you, you just want to just do this thing and they can be quite straightforward briefs as well. And then, of course, you have uh, you go all the way up the spectrum, you get to the much more strategic briefs, which are much more akin, of course, to the, the kind of briefing you would be doing with one of your, you know, maybe one of your external agency partners on a, on a more strategic um, you know, project. And, you know, so do I think that uh, clients and agencies both think that they are good at writing briefs? They probably both do. Uh, having worked both agency and client side, look, I, I think in the end, it, it, you can write as many different brief templates as you want. And uh, I've written many in my, in my career, given what I do. Um, you know, the templates are only as good as what people, you know, put in them. So really, the, you know, the only bit of advice I could give is take some time. When you're doing something more strategic, take some time about thinking about what you put into that brief. Actually, it's, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's like that old saying, which is, you know, I'd have written you a, um, I'd, I'd have written you a shorter letter if I'd had the time. And, you know, that, that is what a, a brief is like, you know, and I think actually some of the best client briefs are often one liners, actually the best strategic ones. So we get a whole mixture in in-house agencies. Um, and I think, I guess what I come back to on, on answering your question is, is that's the point. We don't want it to be quite so formal a process all of the time, because a lot of the stuff that you're doing is so quick turnaround that you've got to you've got to move 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 you know so i hope that helps yeah no that is helpful i'm sure um okay well another question here i i'm going to ask this one because it does um bring in the sort of creativity uh question which um is obviously part of this panel um so someone said from your experience um, how do you continue to firewall the creative side to an in-house agency? Some of the allure of agencies is the magic that happens behind the curtain. Utilising account managers to keep brand managers at a distance. This is inherently hard in-house. Do you have any advice? Um, I guess, um, Simon, shall I come to you on that? What's your view there? Sure, I think building on Giles's point, you know, the fluidity, the ability for people to work in partnership and collaborate is really important. Now we have processes that, you know, we've defined over 17 years that really uh, enable the flow of work to happen. But what we are not prescriptive about is, um, you know, how certain things absolutely have to happen. Because if you do that, you just inhibit people from, um, from working together. So I think that, um, you know, creatively, um, the best work happens when when people do collaborate, and there is no reason why. You know, of course, an in-house agency team cannot go into its rooms and and do things and come out with some magic. And you know, not everything, every moment of the day, isn't about a collaborative process to arrive at a an answer. There is, it's a it's um, a myth to think that you know an in-house agency is subservient to it's brand masters at the creative level you know they are literally working in partnership together and i think that you know there's still wonderful opportunities for um uh, you know creative teams to to go and do their thing and to, to you know get get right into the um uh, the creative process and and come up with amazing work and we want them to challenge the client we want them to come up with things that are are scary for the client you know, and then come out. But it does. It doesn't mean that we have to inhibit the creative process just because they're a, uh, an in-house agency. And the way our model works also is we have multiple layers. So we have people that are not just on site or in-house. We have teams that are uh, in our own offices throughout the world, coming in and out of the client's world as and when necessary. So we actually have the opportunity for creatives to really flourish and grow in whatever environment is right for them. But I absolutely uh, disagree with the, the myth that, that you know, 
there is any reduction in tension or opportunity or uh, or, or creative song autonomous to at least come up with ideas you know what actually might be published in the outside world you know always is a function of um, you know agreement with the client but fundamentally to, to arrive at that point of a wonderful idea you can still do it just as well in-house as you can do in any other uh, environment you're operating in. Yeah I'd quite like to add to that I honestly I think that's a really old school view uh, of whoever uh, of the, the way that question was put you know look at other creative industries they they don't operate um, with uh, you know a pair of people sitting off in a dark room somewhere. Look at film industry, TV industry, everything that goes on in the internet. A lot of it is done through collaboration, and to be honest, you know, just through um, you know. And I, I think, as was said earlier, an idea can come from anywhere. So we, uh, having said that, if that's what people want to do in our in-house agency, then they can go and do it. Um, so it, please don't think that what people do in new studio is just go to loads of workshops. That's not at all the case. Um, it's not collaborative in that. In, it's not. It's not sort of uber collaborative in that sense. We still have, um, you know, the creative teams who who go off and and do their own thing whenever they want to. But I, I think that you just people just need to get used to this idea of it being much more fluid than maybe it used to be in the past. And quite honestly, actually, that's the way that all of the the big external agencies work too in many ways so you know I, I in my role look after the relationship with all of our big uh, external agency partners too and um, they would also sit here and say that that was an old school um, point of view. Okay great we've ended on uh, something a bit provocative there so that's great um, yeah so it's now um, it's 20 to 10 so um, I want to keep to time uh, that was a really good panel, so it just leaves me to thank Scott, Jane, Simon and Giles and um, enjoy the rest of the day. And again, sorry that my camera wasn't working and uh, hopefully that didn't detract too much from anybody's enjoyment of this brilliant session. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.